We look today at uh, 1 John 4, and if ever there was a passage that proved to Earl that we need to read Scripture in context, this would be the passage. I keep hearing this passage referred to, usually simply snippets of it, and then people use that as a springboard to go off in a direction that God never intended. And so let's look at the passage, but let's look at the passage and set it in the context of this larger letter, 1 John, and and look at what John is addressing. I mean, there's a specific story here, and and you look at the story in setting and context. And so 1 John 4 at verse 7 following, Beloved, let us love one another, because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us. And his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father has sent his Son as the Savior of the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God, and they abide in God. So we know and believe the love God has for us. God is love. And those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this way, that we may know boldness on the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because he first loved us. Those who say, I love God, and hate their brothers or sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from him is this. Those who love God must first love their brothers and sisters also. And let us pray. Father, may the word of my mouth, the thought, the meditation, the heart of all here today be acceptable or in the name of Christ our Lord become acceptable. You alone are our strength, our redeemer. Amen. The way I hear this passage misused is to talk about God is love, whoever comes from love is from God. And then love is defined as something entirely different than this own passage defines love. Love here is defined very specifically. Verse 10, in this is love. Not that we loved God, but that God loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And so you've got there a definition of love. Jesus, specifically Jesus, his actions on the cross, his atonement, the idea that the Father sent the Son. You go back to John three sixteen. you know, for God's to love the world. All this is connected into Jesus. It has absolutely nothing to do with sexual desire. Put that on the table. That's what it says. It has nothing to do with my finding some people attractive and others unattractive. It has everything to do with the fact that love comes from God and God defines it, and God defines it in a specific way. Self-giving, sacrificial. You know, we didn't love, God loved us. First big step here. Love comes from God. We can't originate love. 
we can't start love. The world wants to confuse lust, attraction, and love. Totally different animals. Totally different. Love here has to do with behavior. And the behavior is sacrificial, it's self-giving, and it originates in the heart of God the Father. Now, if it doesn't contain those elements, biblically, it's not love. It may be romance, it may be attraction, uh, it may be friendship. It can even, you know, in some ways be considered good. Uh, we have non-Christian people act in moral ways, and we can say their behavior is being good, but it's not biblically love if it doesn't start in the heart of God the Father and is expressed in the sacrifice of Jesus the Son so that in Him, in Jesus, there's salvation. You can't eliminate Jesus' salvation and the biblical definition of love. If you want to know more about love, 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. Every descriptor of love is a verb. It's always action. And it bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. What's being said there? It's positive. It's uplifting. But it's for the benefit of the other person. That description is true here in the passage today from 1 John. It's true in Paul's writings to 1 Corinthians at 13. It's true throughout the story of Jesus. It's, it's for the salvation, the uplifting, the redemption of somebody else. Now, we had a question, I believe it was last week. Who are our brothers and sisters. Y'all remember that? Remember the troublemaker that was raising that? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, the same thing's true here. Why preach on love so heavily? And, and you can go back to chapter 2, and he, chapter 3, he's got love, Chapter 2, love chapter 3, you know, it's, it's, it's not just in one spot. It's throughout this entire book. Why has he got such heavy emphasis on love except John sees a need for us to grow in love? Why is that? The church is not always loving. <laughs> it's okay to say amen. It is. It is. It, I can think of times I've been unloving. I've been aware of times people have had to forgive me because I've acted in ways that were unchristian. And, and the reason why, I mean, he, he closes out on this strong passage. Uh, Those who say I love God and hate their brothers or sisters are liars. I mean, that's not beating around the bush, is it? But specifically brothers or sisters, that's fellow Christians and, and you can weave that even tighter. Fellow Christians in whom you are in community with or have been in community with, maybe have gotten into a fight with somebody over something, and, and, and now you're just raining down judgment on that person. And, and, and God says, you know, don't claim to love me, you know, because look at what you do with your brother or sister. Now, again, Brother or sister here is talking about fellow believer. He's talking about someone that you're in community with. We've got churches on many corners in this community. And so, you know, I don't want to weave this too tightly and say it has to be First Methodist Parsons. You know, you could, you could include First Methodist Decatur. No, I'm teasing. You can include any believer in whom you are in community with. Does that include a next-door neighbor? Yes. Does that include people you work with? Yes. What about if they're uh, people you know through the community that are Christian? Yes. What about if they're in a group that has questionable beliefs about Jesus? 
And that's the problematic area. Uh, without naming names, and let's not name names, uh, there are people in this community that, you know, have been in Christian community and then have gone in other areas and hold to extra biblical position. And one this morning posted his picture of the Book of Mormon on Facebook. Raised in one church and gone to another church and visits here and then now there. Who is my brother or sister? Well, the definition here is they get Jesus right. Now, people want to divorce this passage from the larger passage. But before you get to 1 John 4, 7, you've got 1 John 4, 1 through 6, which talks about testing the spirits. You can't divorce the idea of love from, you know, beloved, do not believe every spirit, 1 John 4, verse 1, but test the spirits to see if they're from God. By this we know uh, that they are from God, for many false prophets have gone out into the world. All right, there's, there's the key point in this entire book. False prophets have gone out into the world. If you back up into chapter 2, you see that they used to be members of John's own community. Verse 19, chapter 2. They went out from us, but they did not belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. Somebody's come to church. They've uh, got some strange ideas. They try to spread those strange ideas. We say that doesn't line up with the historic faith. They leave us, and, 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 and we're saying, no, they're not brother or sister. They're not of us. Uh, he goes on down at verse 24, halfway through, picking up. If what you've heard from the beginning abides in, the, in you, then you will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is what he has promised us, eternal life. So what's being said there is hold to the historic faith. Uh, if you turn over a couple of books, I'm not suggesting you do, I'm suggesting you listen to me, but later at the book of Jude, you know, you've got 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and it's amazing how those come in order, and then the book of Jude, and the Jude book is so short, it's only one chapter. If anybody says Jude chapter 2, you know they've never read Jude. Talks about the faith once delivered to the saints. Even in this early letter in the early church that had people adding on to the Bible, and, and John is saying here, that's not Christian faith. It's the faith once delivered to the saints, to use the phrase from the book of Jude. It's, it's that which has been given us, verse 24b if what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you will abide in the Son and in the Father. Our connection to God is clarified by holding to a strictly biblical position. Now, Mr. Wesley would put it this way. I allow no authority in theory or in practice other than Holy Scripture. Now, somebody will say, where's that in the book of discipline? Well, we're arguing over that as a denomination right now. And you should be able to hear very clearly in my words, hold to Scripture. Hold to the scriptural position. It doesn't matter what any other preacher says. If Earl gets it wrong, if you hear Earl say something that you find questionably based on Scripture, you know, and Earl's wrong, Earl's wrong, or any other preacher, or the denomination of the Book of Discipline, any other earthly authority. John is saying, you hold to what was given you at the beginning. I like to say, remember what you learned in Sunday school, in kindergarten. Just, you know, from the very beginning as you're raised up, if it's, if it's, a verse out of context. Well, all love is from God, and I love this person of the same sex, and therefore that's of God. That argument has been made so many times, and it's 
contradictory to what's actually being said in that same passage that gets quoted. No, love is defined by the Father sending the Son to die in our place, and in Christ we have salvation, and we have back to Jesus the Father, our connection there, through Jesus the Father, through Jesus, our brothers and sisters. Not everybody is our brother and sister. Everybody is our neighbor. Not everybody is our brother. Who are our brothers and sisters? Those that hold to biblical faith. Back to uh, 1 John chapter 2. They went out from us, but they're not of us because had they been of us, they would have stuck with us. In other words, they've, gone, they've passed us by and they've gone something new. The latest fad the latest trend, and they're constantly coming up. So love is from God. Love is defined by God. Love originates in God. It doesn't originate us in us. Where do we come in? We reflect love. We love, why? Because he loved us. We are in this situation, to use a planetary term, we're the moon, not the star. We're the moon, not the sun. We reflect. God loves us, and therefore we love others. And it's very specific here. Don't claim to love a brother or sister who I can see and, 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 and reach out and touch. Don't, don't, don't say you love them if your actions are not loving in the way that God loved us. Don't claim to love God if you don't love your brother or sister. Now again, God's love is what? Self-giving. God's love is sacrificial. God's love is for the good, the better of another person. Why is John preaching so heavy here? I want to reference a question that came up last week, and, 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 and we had to look it up, and somebody beat me. Who was it that beat me to 1 John 5 and 17? One of y'all did. Found it before I did. Uh, I say don't even pray for such a one. 1 John 5... 16, not 17. If you see your brother or sister committing what is a mortal sin, you will ask. What is not a mortal sin, you will ask. And God will give life to such a one. To those whose sin is not mortal. There is a sin that is mortal. I do not say that you should even pray about that. Uh, other translations, instead of saying mortal, a sin that is mortal, will say a sin that is leading to death. Pray, if you see a brother or sister in a sin that is not leading to death, pray for them. But if you see a brother or sister in a sin that is leading to death, I don't even say pray for that person, is what John's saying here. What's the sin that's leading to death? Well, it's back to 1 John 2, verse 18 and following. It's that false teaching, heresy. I'm not even supposed to pray for such a person. How does that, 1 John 4, right before 1 John 5, 1 John 5 tell me, don't even pray for those people. 1 John 4 is saying, don't, don't say you love God if you don't love your brother or sister. Do you see that John is giving us a very strict dividing line on who is our brother or sister? The worst category for John is a person that was in church and claimed church and claimed the God of church and the Christ, the Messiah of church, and then teaches something that's not from God, from church. That's the worst category. And you look at that from 1 John 2, and now at 1 John 5, don't even pray for that person. That's a sin that leads to death. That's the strictest, strictest statement against false teachers that I know of in the Bible. James has something somewhat similar. Uh, let not many of y'all be teachers. Teachers are held to a stricter account. And James, was it 
or for one. Who was it last week that remembered this sentence or found that before I did? One of y'all. Yeah, I wanted to give credit. Since I'd been picking on Carolyn earlier, I was going to give credit to her credit. Yeah, Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and, and and found it before. I I tried to look it up on 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 uh, Google, and y'all got it before me. Uh, this whole idea of false teaching permeates through this one book, First John, such that even when he talks about love, he's giving limits. If I'm not even supposed to pray for that person. Where does love come in? I had a question that if you, you know someone that is being is believing a false doctrine, doesn't believe in the Messiah that he's already come. Um, maybe in more in Mormon church or something. It could be a family member who's unsaved, you know, they're being misled. My, Can my, you pray for those? Yes, you? yes. This is specifically a teacher or preacher. Someone in authority okay. Who, 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 who claims knowledge. Your brother and sister. Your brother and sister. Yes. And they're teaching. And, and, and teaching. What, or, or, or have been in the past, brother or sister. Okay. Maybe, maybe pass through this church on their way to, to another church. Right. My sister, my earthly sister, uh, raised alongside me and ended up uh, for a short period of time in Jehovah's Witness. And I spent a lot of time praying with her. I did not spend any time beating her up, either verbally or physically. Spent a lot of time praying for her. She, she passed out of that stage because she saw the contradictions there. But now, had she become a teacher or preacher in that? And, and the, the key here is they knew better. They had access to true teaching. And again, go back and reread in uh, 1 John 2, uh, that, that passage that begins at 18, uh, and just go all the way through 18 through 25. Um, he's calling them an antichrist, and, and there are many antichrists, for this is the last hour. That's not given in theory. When John writes this, he's thinking of people's names. And they were specifically Gnostics. A Gnostic is a person who claims secret knowledge that nobody else has. Uh, maybe a book nobody else has. Book of Mormon nobody else has. You know, we've got a secret knowledge no one else has. They went out from us. They started in the church. Mormons still use King James Version Bible. But they add to it. And it's that adding to and claiming authority. There are actually five books, I'm told, that have authority in the, in the, in the Church of the Latter-day Saints. First book is the Bible. But then there's the second, third, fourth big book that have authority. And then finally, they say the prophet, whoever's in charge in Salt Lake City, his voice actually is stronger and more authoritative than even the Bible. So, you know, that's... Not wanting to pick on individuals that are in our community, that's a dangerous position. And and Mormons will present themselves as fellow Christians. Because the teaching has been added to, I can't allow that. You know, if if they had King James Version Bible and don't read a modern translation, do I have problems with it? No. You know, uh, there are people among us that will say, you know, if you're not reading King James, well, it's a, it's a, it's okay. That that, but if they add a different book, Jehovah's Witnesses, on the other hand, take our Bible and change the prepositions, so that instead of saying Jesus is the Son of God, they say Jesus is a Son of God, changing a preposition entirely different. That was one reason when I was reading this passage. Um, Earlier at, at verse 10, I stressed the when I said the atoning sacrifice. That was it. Just Jesus, not Jesus and anybody else. Yeah. So, love. 
And there's a reason that he's preaching this because there is division in the church. And there are times that we haven't been loving. And uh, there are people that are named as brother or sister among us. And, uh, you know, rather than if they get off into other things, rather than, you know, let them go, lovingly pray for them. But if they get totally converted and, and are actually proclaiming that is the truth, they, according to this passage, have strayed over into that sin that leads to death, 1 John 5. So it's, it's a hard, being Methodist, I, I tend to stray towards grace. I'm still praying for the person that posted the Book of Mormon on Facebook today and started a firestorm because uh, one of the other congregations that he's attended and been a member of in the past, uh, you know, they're King James only. And boy, they just jumped on that. And he, he still claims as King James. But he also claims the Book of Mormon. All right. That's the basis and we could go literally over every verse and and get something over it but I'm sort of looking at the large view what stands out to you or questions or thoughts you had one thing I didn't cover and, and let me cover the second section that begins at verse 13 uh, uh, how do we know uh, that we belong to God? We have the proof of the Holy Spirit. Um, and that falls in line with Paul's teaching at Romans 8 and 16. The Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. What does it mean to have the Holy Spirit? Or how do I know I have the Holy Spirit? Um, a lot of people that are in my denomination that are very different in theology from me, very different, claim the Spirit. And they say, well, the Spirit is speaking new things in these latter days. And, and since God is love, uh, homosexual marriage is approved of God. How do I know I've got the Spirit? How do I know? Well, I test the Spirit's, verse 1, chapter 4. See if they're from God. They have to proclaim, they have to confess Jesus Christ in the flesh. This is against this uh, earliest heresy, Gnosticism. But one of the things that I look to in the book of Hebrews, uh, every child of God is, is disciplined by God. Those he loves, he chastens. If you haven't known God's correction in your life, you really need to question your salvation. But on the other hand, as he corrects me daily, and sometimes minute by minute, I may be the uh, red-headed stepchild, but I'm in the family. And, and I know that because God's Spirit dwells in me, mostly to correct me, mostly to chasten me. Other thoughts or comments? I have a question about verse 17, uh, about love has been perfected among us in this way, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment. How are we going to be bold on the day of judgment if we're being judged? I just want you to... You're going to tell the Lord when you get there why you should be allowed in, and you're going to tell him that you believe in the Son that he sent his son and that you're a child of God that you you know you believe he died on the cross for my sins I don't even think we'll have to speak probably not that that's what I'm saying it's kind of what we're we not judging that day we've already got it right well he, he's 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 giving us this idea that since we're going to be bold on the day of salvation on the day of judgment because of our salvation why not be bold now okay. since we don't have to the, you know, what he's saying is the worst thing for any person ever to experience will be the judgment of God. 
Since you don't have to worry about that. Why should anything less than that scare you? Uh, Perfect love has cast out all fear. I don't know how many times I've had to quote that to myself. Since I have the perfect love of Jesus that takes away even my fear of judgment. Now, by the way, we will have judgment. Some people say that Christians are not judged. We don't go through the great white throne judgment of Revelation. But now 1 Corinthians 3 speaks of a judgment. It starts with there's no foundation laid than can be laid, that is, Jesus Christ. But he says the day will reveal it, and the day is the day of judgment. And it will be revealed as wood, hay, stubble, or gold, silver, silver, precious stone. What we do with Jesus, is it eternal or does it burn up? Now, we're told that if everything you do with your life burns up, you still make it. And I would add the statement, they may call you Smokey for the first century. <laughs> because he says, the fire, the fire will reveal it. The fire is the fire of judgment. Not a literal fire, but, but an imagery of purifying. That which is pure goes through the fire and comes out on the other side. Gold, silver, precious stone. In other words, what I've done with Jesus made it through judgment. Now, for most of us, especially for Earl, we're probably going to be a mixed bag. Some of our life is going to burn away, and that's just going to be dross. Something, Lord willing, will remain, and that is the gold, silver, precious stone. And I love the imagery uh, uh, of uh, cast our crowns before him. What's, what's, what's the hymn that speaks of... Uh, Casting our crowns. It's an old church hymn. I'm looking to my old church hymn person. Well, I can't come up with the name of it. I know which hymn. I know what you're Yeah, and, 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 and we'll cast it. I mean, <coughs> even the best that we have when we make it to heaven is there only to offer God praise mm-hmm. and adoration. So uh, we'll, we'll be judged. Going to a different imagery to answer the original question, Matthew 25, the separation of the sheep and the goats. And, uh, you know, the Father is clearly in charge, but Jesus is proclaiming their separation. I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of evil. I was hungry. I was naked. I was sick. I was in prison. And I never know you. Depart from me. Well, Lord, when did we? You know, as you've done to the least of these who? My brothers or sisters, you've done to me. That's in the family. And so uh, the judgment is pronounced. I don't think we're going to have to claim it. I think it will be announced. And, and, And some of us might be surprised. I think some of us may be surprised that we make it. I think some of us may be surprised we don't. I've heard it announced in an adult Sunday school class in a United Methodist church that I was pastoring at the time. I know I'm going to heaven. I've done too much good in this world. Well, there is something about works. Ephesians 2 and 10 that you know it was prepared for, but before you get to verse 10, you got 8 and 9. Saved by grace through faith, not of works, lest anyone boast. But we're saved to works. But this person was claiming salvation by works. And it's strictly Jesus. So, again, good theology here, but you need to set it in the context of of the larger passage of the entire book that you're reading it in. And then also in the context of the entire Bible. You've heard me today quote from several different, or at least reference, paraphrasing, several different books of the Bible. You know, and, and I've pointed out how you get the same thought in this other author that's also in the Bible. You've heard me refer to John and then Paul and Jesus himself and Matthew. So it's, it's context that makes sure that we're on track.